so I have, I have presented these slides already on Friday, but then uh, I decided to just change the order, I, and I noticed that this, uh, the same slides uh, told in different order, like put completely different accents on different things, so I decided to change the uh, title, and somehow uh, it's now a different story. Uh, I'm from from I'm from Tokyo, from National Institute of Information and Communication Technology. Part of the results I will uh, show is done together with my colleagues from Tokyo and from Louisiana. But I will introduce also some new ideas, and it is kind of working uh, thing. Uh, I'm working on the ideas now, and if in this part something doesn't work, it's only my fault. So don't blame my colleagues. Uh, so this, this is the first part, introducing these new ideas, and then I will introduce some results also related to this. So first I will introduce uh, compressed sensing in an intuitive way, I hope. Then I will discuss a, a specific algorithm uh, within the uh, compressed sensing paradigm, which is matching pursuit. It's a very simple algorithm, and uh, yeah, I will discuss this. I will discuss its computational bottlenecks, and then I will show that this can be related to a maximum energy problem, which hopefully can be solved by some uh, kind of quantum annealers. Then I will discuss the uh, relation between boson sampling and molecular fibronic spectroscopy and discuss uh, and apply some compressed, compressive sensing techniques to solve uh, the problem of molecular spectroscopy actually in some cases completely classically. And then I will discuss when the classical approach doesn't work and then we probably need then some improvement in terms of quantum. So, now about compressive sensing com or compressed sensing. It is usually applied when you think about unknown signal, uh, but they are not completely unknown, but you know for sure that uh, they are sparse. So you can imagine the set, uh, you can also imagine some uh, degree of sparsity. Sparse means that most of uh, entries in, in a, a signal or a vector are just zero. There are just maybe a few or some number of non-zero entries, which, and this number of non-zero entries is much smaller than the size of the uh, vector. So uh, we want to know some unknown, determine some unknown uh, vector we observe, and we know only that it is sparse. So in principle, we can imagine all possible, uh, set of all possible sparse signals, like here. And then we, what we can do is we introduce some measurements. For me, the measurement is kind of linear function. So I uh, chose uh, some kind of, uh, let's say, filter, and somehow I observe my long vector through this filter and get some number. So mathematically, it can be described as a just product of my filter times the, the unknown vector. So I have here the matrix of my filters or the matrix of patterns. So each row of this, of this matrix is a separate like vector I multiply by my uh, unknown uh, signal, and then I get some number. So the problem now is, uh, given a result of measurements, so these numbers, and the measurement matrix, so the set of filters or measurements, uh, determine a measure, measured sparse signal, the red one, from the set of all candidate solutions. So now I assume also that uh, in the set of all possible solutions fitting this problem, because this problem is normally uh, 
ill-defined in the sense that there is a lot of, so for a given matrix A and for a given uh, measurement result, there are many possible signals that fit to this. So uh, this problem is uh, ill-defined. I assume that in the set of all possible candidates, given Y and given A, I can find the most sparse candidate that fits the data. And then if uh, the number of measurements is too small, the most sparse candidate is not the real one, is not the, the true uh, signal I measure. But then how many measurements I need to distinguish a real signal from some false signal? So if you, if you think about just random measurement, it, it's, it's just one measurement. It serves you to, uh, to exclude if there is this or this. Okay, so uh, let's say that now this set is like that, but then I add just a few additional measurements. I get a few additional numbers, and then I can uh, remove from my set many, actually, candidate vectors. And then I'm sure that the real one is always there. So at some point, the real one, the real uh, signal I measure is the most sparse in the set. And if I have the uh, mechanism to find the most sparse solution uh, that satisfies the constraints, then I found the most sparse. And then people uh, discuss uh, how many measurements you need to uh, determine which is the, um, uh, somehow which is the real signal. And somehow it, it's, so I put here this number, which is derived for some, for some specific type of um, measurement matrix and for some specific uh, algorithms to, to find this, uh, the, the most sparse solution. But just it, it shows you the, somehow the order of uh, magnitudes we discuss. So S is the sparsity. It means uh, how many non-zero entries is in our signal. And then uh, this result was derived for a matrix of uh, actually random patterns. Because in case of random patterns, you have a lot of um, mathematical theories you can use and somehow determine, uh, somehow determine things well. So it, 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 it shows you that somehow the number of patterns scales linearly with uh, the sparsity of your signal and only logarithmically with uh, the size of the signal, which is, can be a big advantage. If you imagine, for instance, uh, an image or, or a picture, normally you need to determine the picture without, like in the most trivial case, you just need to measure each pixel of your image. So it, it will be N. But then if you know that your, uh, your, your image is sparse in some basis, then you can use uh, just the number, of, the number of measurements which is related to the sparsity of. So uh, it doesn't become more more sparse, but it uh, it is it's, it's, it has the same sparsity as always. You only eliminate more more sparse signals, which are not the real one, because you, you eliminate adding additional measurements. Because it, it, it as I somehow as I, uh, said. It's enough just one measurement or a few measurements to distinguish the real signal from some other, let's say, to distinguish two, two, two signals. So the signal is uh, the, the same sparsity all the time, but you, it becomes the most sparse in the set. So somehow you eliminate from the set uh, the signals, candidate signals with less sparsity or more sparsity. And the second question? Uh, it's, 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 
it's actually a, a useful criterion. You can, you can show that with this criterion, so you, you can introduce some other, like, I don't know, the highest, the highest sparsity or the, or the lowest sparsity or, I don't know, the lowest two norm or something like that. So it's just a criterion you introduce, but somehow in this case, if the criterion is the sparsity, uh, the entire procedure goes quickly and people can approve it. And somehow it converges to, uh, fastly to good results. Instead of if you introduce maximal or minimal to norm of this, of this vector as a criterion, you can do it, I tried it, but it takes much more measurements because it is kind of dense, the set of uh, all, all, the all set of uh, vectors that fit to your data with, uh, if, if, you, if you measure just uh, two norms, something like that, is very dense. So somehow adding new measurements, you don't eliminate much of your set. So sparsity is very useful from the practical point of view. Okay, and there, then there exist uh, many algorithms to determine the most sparse uh, candidate solution f fitting to your constraints. Uh, let's say there are many convex optimization algorithms like this one. There are also some iterative algorithms that are computationally uh, more efficient, but not always as uh, exact as this. Uh, among them, we find a very basic one, which is called, called, called matching pursuit, and I will discuss this one further. Okay, then the, uh, for compressed sensing already, there are many applications from like real life, like natural images, bio biomedical images, radar communication signals, uh, compressed speech, audio, and video. And I would add to this, uh, standard list, also big data. I know at least one paper that somehow relates big data analysis to these kind of problems. So I think that big data is also uh, an application of these things. Okay, so I go f uh, further explaining a little bit more about this matching pursuit technique. So this matching per pursuit technique allows you to uh, so allows you to find a sparse signal that fits your measurement data and a given measurement matrix so the algorithm goes like that you initiate uh, your algorithm uh, introducing some additional uh, vector which is the residue initially it is just a vector of measurements your solution is initially zero, a zero vector, then you have something like support detection. Uh, practically, you want to know which column of your measurement matrix is the most similar to your measurement vector. Then if you determine this, so determine the position of this column, you can, you can uh, with high probability, or it depends on the matrix, uh, say that the, in this case, the teeth uh, element of uh, measurement of, of the measured sparse signal has a peak in the teeth, teeth position because, because somehow this uh, 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 column has them like in, uh, contributes the most to your measurement vector. So you need to determine this column which is the most similar to your residue, actually. And then you, you need to solve this kind of problem. So usually when you want to find the most similar column, you uh, somehow take a product of each column and your residue. So you form a long vector. So actually you're, you are looking for the maximum of this long vector. So you, you, this, this support detection reduces to uh, localization of the maxima of this vector, of a long vector. Mm -hmm. And then, so if you do that, if you find this maximum, the position, 
then you update your residue, taking the difference between previous residue and the column, with maybe some step, and uh, you, uh, in, in, in the position you found, you somehow increase uh, the size, the, the height of the peak. So in this somehow very, very simple algorithm, you observe that the computational bottleneck is in finding the maximum of this very long vector in principle. So this is a quite somehow simple problem to imagine, but somehow if you think about algorithms to find the maximum of a vector, it is, you, 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 can, you can maybe not find anything better than just checking one after another element. So the uh, complexity of this, of finding the element of a vector may be like, like the size of the vector, actually. So this is the, the computational bottleneck, because if the vector, like in big data, is very long, then you have problems. Also, in this, in this algorithm, mm, it's very difficult to deal with this algorithm and, let's say, big data if, if you have matrix which, which you need to remember. Because uh, if it is, let's say, random matrix, matrix of random patterns, then you need to keep it in the memory. And then if the size of this matrix is huge, that's like your problem, then uh, you need the memory which you don't have, actually. And then, then, then also the product of a huge matrix and uh, a vector became problematic if you have just random matrix of huge size. Smaller algorithm, logarithmically better. Logarithmic uh, log n is quite good. Good. Okay. So this is my match, uh, matching pursuit, and then I will propose to apply some uh, uh, quantum annealing ideas to solve this actually maxim maximization problem for this vector. So here I have quite abstract, uh, let's say, it's a vector of size 2 to the power of n. And uh, I just number all entries using the binary representation. So, so every entry or each entry is unique, uniquely represented by a path in here. So it's, uh, uh, in other words, it's uniquely represented by, the, by a set of n spins. So a set of n spins can represent uniquely an uh, element of this vector. Maybe not element, then position of the element. Then if I specify just, let's say, two spins and I don't care what happens in the other, then the position of these two, sp uh, two spins determine uh, some patterns instead of a point, because somehow I have the, uh, many degrees of freedom here. Okay, so this is another example of another pattern I introduce uh, in this way, uh, like fixing positions of some spins. And this is another example. Okay, and then I can, I can for, for a, any of these patterns, I can uh, introduce some numbers. Uh, in my interpretation, these numbers are the overlaps with the original vectors. So let's say, then I try to explain the indexes. The indices. Uh, so these upper indices uh, mean that you have a fixed second and third spin in the positions down and up, zero and one, and so on, so on, so on. 
Okay, so now finding the maximum of, uh, okay, so now I, I, I define my measurement matrix A by using exactly these uh, patterns. So I, I somehow uh, find all possible patterns for two spins, for two spins fixed, and say that this is my vector A. And then I need to, uh, E will be my uh, measurement, match, measurement vector. So the results of the measurement, the overlap of these patterns with the thing. And then I observe that maximum overlap, maximum, mm, maximal value of the, uh, from this vector is nothing else than maximization over paths of this let's say, numbers which belong to the given path. You maximize over paths. And actually, this is nothing else that, that finding the optimal, if you interpret these numbers as energy, you just need to find the optimal configuration of spins that maximize the energy. And then if you restrict your uh, patterns uh, to such that you, you analyze only like nearest, nearest neighbor's spin, so patterns corresponding to nearest neighbor's spin, this maximization problem is solved, is, is equivalent to Ising model for 1D spin, classical spin chain. So it is solvable in polynomial time, let's say in the number of spins. Uh, but if you introduce more, pa more like patterns related to let's say like, like greens, not nearest neighbors spins, then you, this maximization is the optimization of configurations with not just nearest neighbors interactions, but you have some interactions between further uh, spins. And this is a problem for uh, quantum annealer, I believe. So I, I think that uh, somehow using this construction, uh, using uh, these patterns related to fixed uh, positions of spins, I can um, I can I can uh, solve a critical problem in matching pursuit in compress sensing uh, using uh, quantum annealer. Okay, now uh, I change slightly the topic. I will. Uh, go back to this so soon because I, I will show how it look how it so how if I just restrict to nearest neighbors I can solve it using Ising so I can solve it classically and then uh, doing this I will show how I find some molecular spectra uh, now musical digression Vienna is the city of music every musical instrument uh, produces sound by, uh, by some kind of vibrations. This is a drum, uh, and uh, the vibrating thing here is the surface. And then uh, these screws uh, serve to tune the drum. So you can change, actually, how the drum uh, sounds tuning it. And you can describe the vibrations of the surface introducing the so-called normal modes, which are similar to this. So it's not ex uh, exactly this because it, these are based on square and this is uh, rounded, but I, I couldn't find better image. So it's something like that. So now imagine that you start with your zero mode vibrations. So your, your uh, drum vibrates in zero mode and then you tune. And if you tune adiabatically, uh, there is a probability that you finish in the normal mode after tuning, if the, the zero normal mode after tuning. But if you tune like suddenly, it's uh, more probable that uh, initially vibrating in, one, in, in the um, ground state, you find yourself in some combination of all states. Okay, so now imagine that your drum is quantum and uh, we have harmonic uh, approximation for the for the vibrations. <coughs> so, uh, 
so you can introduce uh, uh, creation and annihilation operators for the harmonic quantum harmonic oscillators. So in this case, you have just in you, in this case you have just two modes to consider. Uh, yeah, and it is not not more not much more uh, you can take from the drum. That this analogy will help me to introduce uh, the ideas of vibrating molecules uh, with electronic uh, electronic excitations. So vibrational transition in molecules when the when the uh, molecule is excited by electronic transition are called Frank Condon factors. And the image is like that. So imagine that your uh, molecule is just like a vibrating drum, but now it has much more degrees of freedom. So it's not two-dimensional harmonic oscillator or two-mode harmonic oscillator, but now it is like multi-mode harmonic oscillator. Okay. <clears throat> and now you can imagine that initially it uh, vibrates in its ground state in all modes, and then it is electronically excited. When you excite an, a molecule electronically, it changes, uh, the, the forces in the molecule can change, so the a normal mode of vibrations, the frequency of vibrations can change. So you, in the excited state, electronically excited state, you have um, slightly different uh, harmonic oscillators or normal modes than in the ground state, and then from you're given, uh, if, you, if you just excite your molecule, these vibrations can be tran translated into somehow many modes in the excited states. And then uh, people introduce something like the change of co normal coordinates. So you can calculate using some very complicated app initial calculations, the structure and normal modes of your ground state uh, uh, molecule and excited state molecule, and uh, you can approximate the relation between them by uh, like linear transformation when U is the so-called Dushinsky matrix. And then if you have this change of coordinates, you can observe that uh, the change of coordinates in your harmonic oscillators can be given by this kind of uh, Bogolyubov transformation for your uh, ladder operations. So here are the uh, coefficients I don't want to discuss. But somehow it's, it's a simple uh, um, Bogolyubov transformation. And then people observe that this transformation can be somehow this is the a, 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 a dagger are bosonic uh, operators, creation and annihilation operators. So the same transformation can be observed in an optical bosonic system. So we'll be observing optical Gaussian transformation. And actually, you can, mm, therefore, these guys show that uh, you can simulate the transitions or Frank Condon factors or transitions, uh, vibronic transitions of your molecules in an optical system which is very similar to boson sampling. Okay, so a very short introduction to boson sampling. You have kind of interferometer with some specific input states and then joint photo detections at the end in all modes. And then it became particularly famous after the paper by Aronson Arkipov, who showed that uh, this sampling is equivalent to sampling from the distribution of permanence of some matrices related to this. And then people know that permanence for some specific matrices, like complex matrices, taken randomly from the Haar measure distributions uh, are difficult to calculate. Okay? For, for classical computer. So if you can sample from this, you can do something different, something, something else than uh, classi the classical computers can do. Then people introduce also some kind of Gaussian boson sampling. So this boson sampling by Aronson and Arkipov 
uh, was with single photons in some modes and vacuum in the other modes. We will introduce also Gaussian version of uh, mm, boson sampling uh, with just some Gaussian state in the input and somehow you can calculate easily Gaussian state of the output, but then you sample photon numbers from this Gaussian state. So this part, this sampling from a Gaussian state is difficult and is, uh, people uh, show that it's equivalent to the things called loop Hafnians, which can be even more complicated than permanents. And they are related, it's the definition, related to some uh, graph theoretical, let's say, things. Okay, so for, for us it's only important that somehow boson sampling from, sometimes boson sampling from uh, just Gaussian state is difficult. And then people, uh, okay. Okay, and then uh, the important thing is that somehow people show that this can be simulated by boson sampling, actually by Gaussian boson sampling, and sometimes it is, uh, uh, calculating this loop halfness is very difficult, therefore maybe somehow a boson sampling can offer us a better way to determine uh, vibronic spectroscopy. But then we observe that somehow uh, computational complexity of, um, ga of boson sampling or Gaussian boson sampling is proved for very specific cases of something like hard, hard random matrices, <clears throat> which somehow is, if you want to simulate your molecule on this setup, you apply some unitary transformation related to this actually change of normal coordinates, but it is, for me, it is not obvious that it is a random har, uh, random matrix taken from har measure distribution. So it's, uh, for me, it's rather somehow something more regular. So I don't mm, think that the complexity of, uh, bos of boson sampling with this matrix that corresponds to a physical system like molecule is always of the same complexity as a boson sampling with these hand hard random measurements. So single mode is here just spatial mode. So all photons are indistinguishable. All photons are the same, have the same frequency. Okay. So how about photon number? Like the photon number, so in this theory by these guys, there is some relation between photon numbers and uh, number of modes to have the condition in which this problem reduces to a very difficult problem. So it's not arbitrary. So people, uh, so at least in this paper, people show a uh, sufficient condition for being classically uh, difficult, but it is not uh, clear if this uh, sufficient condition is also necessary. So people say that if, if this condition is satisfied, then it is difficult, but it is not only if. So people don't know only if, w w when in all cases. Okay, therefore we uh, developed a, uh, uh, thing based on compressed sensing. We say that when boson sampling output is sparse, then uh, boson sampling is classically simulable. And then we use our uh, tricks with compressed sensing. We say that we need to find just marginal distribution for partial measurements, for some specific, um, specific measurements of the modes. And then uh, the question is if these partial measurements or it's related to our measurement matrix in uh, boson sampling, in compressed sensing, are efficient. And then we found the Gurwitz algorithm is theory 68 in Aronson Arkhipov that says that for a small number of outputs you can do it uh, quite efficiently. So you can find these partial measurements quite efficiently. So these are these numbers we need in our 
compressed sensing things. And for boson sampling, Gaussian boson sampling, uh, you can calculate loop Hafnians for small matrices still. So, so it is efficient, let's say. The second part, if uh, we need to show that uh, compressive sensing uh, algorithm from this data to uh, to our uh, to, to, to the joint distribution is efficient, and actually it is what I discussed before when I restrict myself only to so something like nearest neighbors partial measurements, then the problem reduces to the Ising model, which is classically solvable in polynomial time. So we can do. So maybe I'm out of time, so I will not uh, go to details about the proof, but actually this is exactly the same as I discussed on the picture. So this is just more mathematical formulation of what I had uh, just showed in picture previously. Uh, so just how it works in practice. We take a vacuum state. We introduce the Bogorybo transformation related to the Dush Dushinsky matrix. Uh, we find a marginal distribution for nearest neighbors using loop Hafnians. They are recently very nice paper showing us how to, how to do that how to calculate these uh, distributions for actually for for number of uh, any number of photons in, a, in any gaussian state uh, then uh, we introduce our technique our improved uh, matching pursuit and then these are two results for two molecules this is a molecule of formic acid with a symmetry block with seven modes uh, the blue peaks are calculated based on exact calculations, which for seven modes are still kind of efficient. So we calculated how it should be, and the orange ones are from our compressed sensing approach. So we see that they are fit quite well. They are allow, allowed us to, to find the most significant lines in this formic acid case. Then the most challenging was timing with 26 modes. Um, the space of this is quite uh, huge. And then we find, found we could not run the blue things because at least for our PCs it is too uh, advanced. Yeah, yeah, uh, here we show the, so, something like the Yeah, 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 it, it will, it will affect, but somehow, so, so here actually it's not experimental, it's still uh, an simulation with some supercomputers of the, like with, with the same approach. So it gives these lines, but then they also uh, show the uh, relations between these peaks and the, what they can measure in the experiment. This is quite, quite good agreement. So in this case, the unharmonicity is not uh, yet so strong. No, okay. mm -hmm. So, so it, it may be more difficult. And also, uh, also we calculate everything in zero temperature. So we calculate the transition from a zero ground state to like, uh, yes, 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 yes. But so, somehow we, we compare these results with this based on very advanced techniques and we see that we can determine the positions of the main peaks. These three peaks are here, the one is here, and these two peaks are here. We, we cannot find all because the problem is not, let, let's say, because our technique with just nearest neighbors measurements is good for very sparse signals. If the signal uh, is less sparse or more dense, then it's not enough to have just nearest neighbors. And then we, we think that we need to, ex to have just more data, more constraints. And then we think that we, if we introduce these kind of interactions with non-necessary nearest neighbors, we add somehow uh, like marginal distributions for 
uh, first and fifth and so on and so on. We have more data, but we, don't, we cannot uh, solve this maximization problem using this Ising model on the paper or on our computers. So we need something like uh, uh, quantum simulators. Okay, so summary. I propose to apply quantum annealers to some compressive sensing subroutines. I discuss how the compressive sensing techniques can be applied to molecular fibering spectroscopy. If the output is sparse enough, the system is simulable classically, despite of the fact that uh, you, do, you, you can run a com, uh, boson sampling simulator. Also, boson sampling with sufficiently sparse output can be simulate, simulable classically. Okay, that's all. Sorry for the time. Okay. Here. So this transformation is actually so this uh, trans this transformation for uh, uh, creation operators. These are creation operators for, for phonons in uh, your molecules, and then they are bosons as well. So the same transformation can be done on photons because they are bosons. So this is crucial. So the, the thing is that you can, you, your simulator must somehow simulate this transformation. And then in zero temperature, you start with zero, zero like some, somehow uh, ground vibra vibrational state, which corresponds to your vacuum. So you start with vacuum, you apply this transformation, and you have the uh, some, some out, Gaussian output state, and then your sample, which, which corresponds to somehow particular tra transitions uh, in, in different modes. You chose some different numbers of phonons here and photons there. Yes, I didn't use machine learning uh, term. Uh, in machine learning, you usually need to train your machine you, uh, applying something, some initial data. Uh, and then. Yes, yes, yes. I, I think that many ma machine learning techniques also use some kind of optimization, like optimization of your gain function or something like that. So finally, you need to find or also kind of gradient descent or things like that. It's something people use also here. I, I think there is a connection. Okay. Uh, it, I, I thought about this, but no, I, I think that it it's rather, rather like uh, maybe Machine learning is more general and it is more specific. Yes. So it may be. Like constrained base exactly. optimization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was wondering, perhaps you have considered that and you work for some reason, which is interesting that you say you have only different stuff, but not design. 
yeah, yeah, I didn't uh, explore fully these things because I just uh, maybe started uh, uh, this topic uh, quite recently. But somehow, somehow this this connection uh, actually we do the connection now between the quantum annealers and boson sampling, which is also quite in interesting. We can choose the kind of uh, let's say measurement patterns that such that a boson sampling problem is translated to a quantum annealer problem. So this is, in my, my opinion, very interesting because somehow sometimes you can maybe have some advantage from one platform and sometimes from the other. Yeah, so, so now I can just say that somehow, so I observed that my unitary transformation uh, for this molecule, so I, I don't see a particular structure there. I just somehow observed that the output from the boson sampling uh, for, for this experiment is sparse. Like, like it's like just a few, a few important peaks in your vibrational. Things it corresponds to just transitions from your ground state, maybe to like just and there is the most important contribution in the excited state that takes most of the energy when you excite this, or or just low lower number of uh, photon numbers are more likely to be excited than uh, higher numbers of on numbers or things like that. So you, you can expect that the spectrum in this case or the output from the boson sample is sparse. And then you guess that somehow this unitary must be something uh, like very structured. Because it's for sure not random because somehow people in boson sampling they also have the idea that when you apply real these hard random things you have something like anti-grouping or something like that. So you don't usually produce things. I think that it, it, it is something like that. Because you have just more, more complicated molecules. The number of modes in your in vibrational modes is like three times the number of atoms. So if you have a molecule with somehow 200 atoms, you have these molecules, and you are interested in how they vibrate. So this is complicated like crazy. And then these sub-matrices can be something like just how random, I guess. 